r slash no sleep posted by you slash with bite i was the lawman in a small town the cell held a hideous secret this was not what dreams were made of a single street of liquor stores and pawn shops and boarded up shells the old men sitting on wooden boxes playing checkers the three-legged dog that went from stranger to stranger hoping for a scrap of food and the police station that most times felt like a motel for drunks and lost souls my station I joined the police with a mind to becoming a detective in a big city, LA or NYC. I'd solve homicides and bust cartels and hang out with beautiful women. That was 30 years ago. Now this was my beat. I was the lone cop in a one-horse town. The land was not fit for farming and there was no manufacturing or chemical plants. Not a whole lot of anything for folks who wanted to earn a living. But there was hope on the horizon. I climbed out of my patrol car, stretched and winced as my back cracked. I spent too long sitting on my backside. And when it wasn't behind the wheel or my desk, it was propping up the bar at Marty's. On Tuesdays and Thursdays at Marty's the peanuts were free and any broken teeth you found in the bowl you could keep. On Fridays there was a square dance which always ended in a brawl, so Fridays I stayed home and watched TV. Once my back had stopped complaining at being forced into action I looked out into the distance. It was pretty much empty, as empty as it had always been, but if things worked out that was going to change. A big bucks organization that specialized in such things had won a government contract to build a supermax correctional facility, a sprawling high-tech home from home for the worst kind of lawbreakers. And the organization wanted to site it out there in the desert, within an easy truck ride of my town. There'd be money flooding in and people, a lot of contractors during the construction itself and then the guards and support staff. They'd need places to live and eat and let off steam. Good times they were a-coming to my small town. There was just some smoothing out needed first. I climbed back into my car and drove to the mayor's office, stopping once to let Marty collect a critter that lay expired in the middle of the road. Sundays was stew night at the bar and I often gave that a miss as well. The mayor's office lay at the western end of the high street next to the grocery store. The store's window had a display of canned goods which had not changed in all the time I had lived here and a sign saying no refunds no credit no spitting. The store's owner was sat on a rocking chair by the door. He nodded a greeting, and I could not tell you if it was the chair or his neck which creaked. I nodded back then pushed through the fine glass doors which took you into the local seat of power. The mayor came from a long line of mayors. His father, his grandfather and his great-grandfather had all held the position and that seemed to suit the townsfolk just fine. The gravy train had traveled down a lot of their family lines as well. Having only lived in the town for a decade I was still regarded by some as a newcomer. But I knew my way around. I knew my way very well indeed. I tipped my hat at the mayor's secretary. She was a fine woman with cascading brown hair and recently breathed. I was planning on asking her if she would like to step out with me one evening and had taken to wearing deodorant on the days that I knew I would see her. I strolled on, into the mayor's office. He was sat behind the impressive oak desk that came with the job, smoking a cigar and scowling at a laptop. His jowls hung limply over a shirt collar like fleshy pink drapes and his nose was a mess of red broken veins. The mayor had a mighty liking for the drink and round here that made him a man of the people. I pulled up a chair, took off my hat and wiped the sweat from my face. He glanced up from his laptop and drawled, we've got to get this done before they'll sign on the dotted line. I've had more emails from the organization telling me. I told you I would sort it, I replied, and if the business suits that want to build their shiny new prison here are raising your blood pressure, then today is the day. The mayor's eyes narrowed as he looked at me. You'll clear out the trash? I smiled. I will do better than clear, I will blast it away. He nodded and showed his teeth in a tight smile. They were crooked and yellow. I wished him a good day and headed out to take care of things. It was an hour's ride to the Clunes homestead. On the blueprints I had seen, the northern perimeter fence of the proposed correctional facility would run right through their dilapidated shack and outhouses. The organization had made a more than generous offer which would allow them to relocate. But the clunes were not the moving type. This was their patch of dirt. They'd been living here, breeding here, and dying here for as long as anyone could remember. The patrons and Marty's said that, if you dug down deep enough, you'd get to dinosaur bones but before then they'd all be clunes. That day, I was progress brandishing a holster and a badge as I marched onto their property. There was no one in sight so I made my way round the back of the shack. The ground was littered with broken and rusty things. I took in a hoe snapped off at one end, a vicious looking scythe and a barrel full of rainwater, 
before my eyes were drawn to a pair of ladies under breeches hanging from a clothesline strung between two poles. I like to improve myself by learning new words from the three-volume dictionary which took pride of place in my parlor and the word which sprung to mind when I looked at those flimsies was voluminous. I shuddered and then noticed Pocklunes was emerging from one of the outbuildings. He was skinny as the handle of a broom and his hair stood up coarse and bristly to complete the impression. A large clay jug dangled from his hand. It would be full of the famous Clunes moonshine, I figured, and the still must be in the outbuilding. No one outside the family had ever drunk their moonshine and survived, so legend went, and I believed in legends. Pocklunes squinted at me and his mouth curled in displeasure. I could see he had two teeth, one on top and one directly below. Enough for chewing and to inflict a nasty bite. The law has no authority here, he said. You are trespassing. I stood up tall, my deputy's badge gleaming. I am here to deliver an ultimatum, Pa. If you and your kin are not cleared from this place by sundown then I'll be returning with the boys. Pa Clune's expression hardened into a sneer. No one tells me what to do. Not those city slickers wanting to build on my land or you with your thin badge and matching shoes. Sundown, Pa, I replied and turned slow to show I was not scared. I started my car. My next port of call was minutes away. The organization behind the proposed prison correctional facility knew about the derelict building that was the only other thing out here in the desert. They thought it would just need demolishing. It wasn't that simple. Billy and Tommy Mulgrew were waiting for me in their customized truck next to the building. They were twins, both with a shock of red hair and freckles on their cheeks. They were born and remained conjoined, at the shoulder, with one arm each on the opposite side. They rarely spoke to other people and communicated with each other with glances. The townsfolk cared little about their difference, though there had been a clash when they both wanted to marry the same woman. She had been willing, but the preacher had refused. He had said it was against the will. For my part, the Mulgrew twins were strong and followed orders easily and that was the sum of it. They gave me a little salute when they saw me, one right-handed, one left, and I returned the favor. The building alongside which we were parked up was a squat, ugly stone structure. Constructed in the 1950s it had once been used a holding place for prisoners working on chain gangs, saving the half day's drive back to the penitentiary. There were cells and an office for the guards. I climbed out and wandered over to the truck. Shovels lay in the back and garbage bags. I waited for Billy and Tommy to finish their smokes and break wind simultaneously, then said, let's get this over with. The story of what had happened here was no secret to the townsfolk. But it had never been shared with the outside world, because the town's business, was the town's business. I must admit, as Billy and Tommy cut off the padlock on the door, I felt a twinge of unease. I'd heard a lot of secrets in my time as the town's lawman. I knew about crimes that had been dealt with in the middle of the night with baseball bats and hobnail boots, about bootlegging and corruption and more, and I had learned to live with them. But the secret of the building which we were about to enter sat very uncomfortably with me. The old metal of the padlock gave. Tommy swung open the door. The story that I had been told was that in the summer of 1951 the prisoners had been working on building the road through the desert. The heat had been vicious and when the prisoners had glanced up at the unusual sound of a plane passing overhead, they had shielded their eyes and seen only a blur, before their guards were yelling at them to get back to it. The guards all lived in town and were known to be particularly cruel and lazy. That day, no one had reacted when the engine started to stutter, and it was only by the time that the stutter had turned into a howl and the plane was spiraling downwards that they ran. Or at least, the guards ran. The prisoners, still shackled, could only shuffle, and the plane crashed close to them. Before it had ground to a halt, thick smoke had begun to pour from a crack in the hull. The guards said the prisoners were engulfed in the smoke and when they staggered clear of it were choking and scratching at their eyes. The gas was not done though, it was drifting every which way and the guards were afraid they would be caught in it. So, they herded the prisoners into the building, locked them in the cells, then got the hell away. The last thing the guards recalled was the screams of the prisoner they had left behind. The story became hazy after this. There was talk of secret experiments. There were rumors of cover-ups, of conspiracies, some involving the army, some the CIA, both in league with the mayor and lawman of the day. Whatever the truth of the matter, the prisoners were never released. They were left to rot in the cells. And that was wrong, in my opinion. Alain Prost. I believed in legends, and I believed in evil, and evil had ruled in this place. As I followed Billy and Tommy into the building, the air was stale and clogged with dust. Light streamed in through barred windows. 
We were the first people to enter the building in the years since the plane crash and the final incarceration of the prisoners. When the clunes were cleared off and the contract was signed, as I was determined it would be, I did not want the contractors demolishing the building to find the remains of the prisoners. That would lead to questions and more delays. No, sir. We would we sweep up the bones of the prisoners, toss them in the truck and find a burial place further out, where they'd never be found. And the outsiders would see only termites and spiders and dirt when the bulldozers moved in. I moved along the corridor. The office was to my right. A yellowed newspaper, a deck of playing cards and a pack of cigarettes sat on a desk, left behind when the guards had fled. Ahead of me lay the cells. They were all empty, apart from one. The guards, in their haste to get away, must have forced all the prisoners into the first cell in the block. Crammed them into the small space. The prisoners' skeletal remains were piled on top of each other. The bones of hands and wrists reached through the bars, and the lines that had been scratched on the stone floor as they desperately clawed at the ground trying to get away from the crush within were still visible. I felt nauseated, angry. But there was nothing I could do, apart from get the cell emptied. I told Billy and Tommy to pick the lock, it took them long minutes, but then they were in and beginning to scoop up the bones into the garbage bags. Then Billy grimaced. Something bit me, he exclaimed. Nothing had bitten Tommy, it seemed, but he looked pained as well due to bond the brothers shared as he scanned the ground. There's nothing here, he said, the only thing with teeth is. He never finished. He yelped in pain. Then, holding his leg, he started to jump up and down, forcing his brother into the same clumsy jig. I peered into the cell and swore to myself. The jaws of a skull were clamped around Tommy's ankle. Get it off, he yelled. Billy tried to kick the skull off but it held firm. Tommy was screaming by now and I looked on in horror as blood began to trickle from his ankle over his boot, and as an arm rose from the pile of bones that lay all around them and grasped Billy, closing its bony fingers over his wrist. His eyes widened in shock. The arm began to pull, it was trying to pull him down. And he could not resist. There was nothing either of them could do and the twins were dragged into the bones, which now rippled and rattled and shook. Fear gripped me. The remains of the prisoners were somehow moving, animated by an unnatural force that was beyond my understanding. And now the bones were crawling over Billy and Tommy, prodding and poking and piercing their skin. A spine wriggled its bony segments into Billy's open mouth and slipped down into his throat, cutting off his screams. One skeleton, complete from its waist up dragged itself onto Tommy and bit down into his throat. Soon I had lost sight of the twins altogether beneath the writhing mess of bones. I was shaking and freezing cold, even though I was soaked in sweat. I had to do something. But what? I was desperately trying to think when I heard something scraping against the ground. I looked down and saw a skeleton dragging itself towards me. It was whole. Its empty eye sockets looked at me and its jaw opened as if it was trying to speak. I turned tail and I ran. I heard things moving behind me but did not look back until I was in my car. The engine started first time. I was so relived I almost wept. I looked up, back at the building. A river of bones was dancing its way towards me, but I did not see how they would break into my car. I would make it. I would escape. I reversed, swung around. I was driving away when I saw them in my mirror. It was Billy and Tommy, which was impossible. The bones must have killed them. And yet there they were staggering out of the building. Their skin was swollen and bruised and in places it looked like it had been ripped away. Their clothes were torn and soaked with blood. They walked stiffly, their single arms held out in front of them, and their faces were twisted into expressions of primal rage. As I stared in horror, they screamed together. A guttural, inhuman cry that sent terror rushing through me. I floored the accelerator, but now Billy and Tommy were running. They were catching me, and clambering up onto the car holding on even though I swerved and swerved, desperately trying to throw them off. I did not see the clune shack coming up until I almost struck it. I veered at the last minute. The car rolled and I was thrown clear. Pain shot through my body but I had no time to hesitate. I jumped to my feet and sprinted away. Round the back of the shack, away from the twins. Pa Clunes was there. What the hell are you doing, lawman, he yelled. I tried to tell him what was following me. Dead, I gasped. Still moving. The dead walking. Chasing. Here. He shook his head. Looked at me like I had lost my mind, until he saw them behind me. I could tell from his eyes. The confusion which filled them. I span round. Billy and Tommy were staggering towards us. Billy's neck must have been snapped when my car rolled and his head hung loosely to one side. 
Tommy was staring straight at us. His teeth were bared. I turned to Pakloons. They're going to kill us, I told him, and when they do, we'll be like them. My guts told me this. The part of me which believed in legends, and evil. Evil which twists science, and hides the truth, and abandons men to die, only when evil reigns then there are things worse than death. Things coming closer. Things about to strike. Billy and Tommy were almost on us. Pakloons leapt to one side and picked up the scythe which had been lying on the ground. He swung it in a looping arc. The scythe sliced open Billy's chest and he did not flinch. Pakloons raised the scythe again but slipped as he swung and this time its blade landed on the joined shoulder of the twins, cutting clean through it. The twins staggered, moved apart. Tommy looked at his brother. Billy struggled to do the same, finally managing to twist his face towards his brother. Even through the madness which possessed their features I could see their confusion. For the first time, the twins were separated. They were two now, not one, and it had stopped them in their tracks. Pakloons was the first to react. He stumbled into the outhouse where the still was. I heard hammering then watched as a trail of thick, foul-smelling liquid began to flow out. It was the moonshine, I realized. He had broken open the still. He emerged, taking a lighter from his pocket. The moonshine had almost reached my feet. Run, he told me. I did not need telling twice and sprinted away. He followed. Billy and Tommy were still in a daze because they had been split in two and stood swaying as the moonshine trickled over their feet. I heard a click, saw Pakloons throwing the lighter through the air. Its flame flickered. Seconds later it landed in the moonshine now pooling around the winds. Flames began to lick at their legs as the moonshine ignited. They howled but they did not go down. It's not enough, I cried. Pakloons ignored me and kept his attention fixed on the ground where, I now saw, the trail of moonshine reaching back to the still was igniting. The flames raced into the outhouse. Pakloons grinned. And the outhouse exploded. The twins were caught full on in the blast, and through the flames I could make out their bodies blackening and twisting as the fire consumed them. I fell to my knees in relief. Pakloons took a cigarette out of his pocket, tapped it on the back of his hand, leant over, lit it in a flaming pool of moonshine and said through a mouthful of smoke, I don't like strangers on my land. Thank <laughs> you.